the dispersion dynamics solution for superconductivity was given to the American Physical Society March meeting in Los Angeles in 2018. The theory of superconductivity was given to us 60 years ago by Bardeen, Cooper and Schrieffer. The isotope effect showed that lattice distortions bind Cooper pairs with zero momentum and zero spin. Subsequently, high temperature superconductivity was discovered with a critical temperature an order of magnitude greater, but not proportionate isotope effect. An explanation is therefore needed. The main difference is ionicity in the ceramic compounds. This allows optic phonon modes to produce lattice distortions with Varnier excitons. In 10 minutes, I've got nothing to say for magnetic dispersion. Fast forward to 1994. Based on processing parameters, the fact that the carriers are positively charged is the most important feature which distinguishes high TC from low TC. Widely acknowledged, but actually false, and we need dispersion dynamics to sort it out. The main difference is that high TC has the positive hole coefficient. How come? Charge carriers are holes. What is a hole? An electron vacancy in an otherwise filled valence band. Can the Lorentz force act on voids? No. Or immobile positive ions? No. How then can RH be positive? To sort it out, we operate on the stable, dual-wave particle packet with the Klein-Gordon equation. Here's the packet. And the result of the operation is a second-order equation, which is simplified here with simple units. This equation is exactly the same as you get if you take Einstein's formula in special relativity and substitute for energy with Planck's law and for momentum with the de Broglie hypothesis. Now, if you differentiate this equation, you get an equation with three velocities. The product of the phase velocity with the group velocity is equal to c squared. This is an example of physical quantum mechanics. We we'll say a bit more about that in a moment, but first we have to derive the second derivative is the inverse of the effective mass. It has two components and we apply that inside Newton's second law of motion to derive a special feature in the Lorentz law of magnetism. Going back, Dirac calculated the speed of the electron equal to c. This is unphysical in relativity and an example of applied mathematics. By contrast, physical quantum mechanics uses tested hypotheses. Here's the dispersion for a free particle, and the group velocity is exactly the same as you note in relativity, it tends to C at high k. Meanwhile, the phase velocity is faster than the speed of light. It's singular in the rest frame, showing that here time is Newtonian within the convergence sigma. Meanwhile, the second derivative is always positive, unlike the antiparticle, where it's negative. Now, in, the, in a crystal field, this free particle dispersion is made to fluctuate, forcing the effective mass to be sometimes positive and sometimes negative. Let's have an example. Copper is the metal with the highest conductivity. Here are the 3D valence bands, and above them, the 4S bands are parabolic. They pass through the Fermi level, where the curvature is positive, and the hole coefficient is negative. Consider, secondly, a typical semiconductor. The valence bands have negative curvature, the conduction bands have positive curvature. In a P-type semiconductor, the Fermi level is close to the valence bands. The itinerant electrons have negative curvature and positive hole coefficient. By contrast, n-type uh, semiconductors have electrons with positive curvature and negative hole coefficients, like copper. Consider thirdly aluminum. Weight for weight, it has a conductivity even higher than copper. And here the three S bands 
pass through the 3P valence bands and intercept the Fermi level where the uh, curvature is negative and the whole coefficient is positive. So we can sum up these iconic models. Aluminum, p-type silicon, high TC materials have positive hole coefficients and negative curvature. Copper, n-type silicon, low TC compounds have negative hole coefficients and positive curvature. In confirmation, n-type ceramics are low TC. We need to unwrap a hole measurement, holes in high TC and superconducting state. The hole measurement occurs in two moments, a transient current and a steady state hole voltage. What happens if a charged particle enters a magnetic field? Does it reinforce the field or oppose the field? The Lorentz law shows that it opposes the field. The curvature is opposite to the curvature of the electrons in the solenoid coil. But if the, this electron is moving in a crystal field with negative curvature, it reinforces the field. And the whole coefficient is positive, the same sign as ionic conductivity. So we understand now why high TC has a positive whole coefficient. What about the superconductors themselves? We will consider the cuprates because they're the best known and because they have the highest critical temperatures as a group. And the first that was discovered was barium dope-lanthanum cuprate. Barium is divalent, lanthanum is trivalent. This is a p-type uh, superconductor, like the p-type semiconductor. In YBCO, there are 13 cationic charges and divalent anions. So there's a, there's a stoichiometric mismatch. When it's underdoped, it's non-superconducting. When it's overdoped, the critical temperature is 93 Kelvin. What happens during baking in oxygen is that these planes absorb oxygen ions, drawing electrons from the superconducting plane, and this is confirmed by Madeleine potential calculations. The holes are therefore formed in superconducting planes. Something similar happens in BISCO, though it occurs during solid state reaction, and there are three types. The single layer, like LABCO, the double layer, like IBCO, with a similar TC, and triple layer, BISCO 2223, with a critical temperature of 111 Kelvin. And again, holes which are calculated by the Madeleine potential calculations. So these holes are measured by the hole coefficient at normal temperatures, do they disappear when the superconductor is cooled through critical temperature? There's no reason for that. The Coulomb force that binds the compounds binds also the Cooper pairs. The holes in a hole effect are Vanier excitons. So we have a situation where two fermions form one boson. The fermions have to be coherent and two excitons form the Cooper pair. The boson pair is a real wave function. The condensed boson C lies 10 milli electron volts below the Fermi level. But now we have another conundrum, even harder than the previous one. In a superconductor, the electric field, for obvious reasons, is equal to zero, and the excitonic pairs are uncharged. And yet we measure a supercurrent. What are the electro electrodynamics? Where is the force? We understand that the electrodes supply the gap energy to break the Cooper pairs. In the reduction of the wave packet, two electrons transport without resistance in Newtonian time. And after further time, pairs reform by Bose statistics, provided that temperature, current density, and magnetic field intensity are all below critical. This restores the the reformation restores the equilibrium in fermions and supercurrents. The same happens in high TC and low TC. So what have we done? The sign of the Hall coefficient depends on curvature. Uncharged wave functions reduce to supercurrents in field E equals zero. The conclusion is that dispersion dynamics gives unified solution for low TC and high TC. 
and the root-to-room -room temperature ITC is given by spectacular atoms. Some are shown uh, below. 